not choose methods, free of persuasion. We also want patients to have the right to prompt LARC removal or IUD and implant removal for any reason, without judgment or resistance from the provider. I'm also just gonna put a quick plug here for an organization called California Latinas for Reproductive Justice. For those of us that are based in the state, also great for if we have anybody from out of state as well. I know we've had a couple of out of staters in the conference as well. Um, but this organization just has really great resources and have been really helpful for me in my own personal journey to learn about reproductive justice and being involved in this work. So I just highly recommend that you give them a quick Google search. Okay, we're gonna dive right into implicit bias now. And I'm just gonna double check if there are any questions. I don't think so. Okay. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with implicit bias as a framework, but one thing I want to make sure that we distinguish first is the difference between implicit bias and explicit bias, right? So explicit bias is prejudices that we consciously have, right? Or biases that we have that we're very much aware of. So for example, I've been a vegetarian for pretty much most of my life, and I know that I definitely have an explicit bias in favor of vegetarians and vegans, right? When I meet somebody that doesn't eat meat, they just get like a little extra point or a little heart in my head. Um, if you're a vegan, you get extra hearts because you, you are where I aspire to be. Um, and I know that it's not fair, right? I know that's a bias I have, and I know that it's not necessarily just, but I know that I have it. And obviously that's a relatively lighthearted example, and, but I don't wanna diminish how impactful explicit bias can be in contraceptive care and can be in healthcare overall, right? But today we're gonna to be focusing on implicit bias. So we're just gonna start off with the definition because I feel like that's helpful when we're kind of looking at the Zoom void or the online learning void. Um, but implicit biases refer to the attitudes of stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. It's also known as unconscious bias, right? So the distinguishing quality between an explicit bias and an implicit bias is personal awareness. So with explicit biases, right? We know that we have these biases. Like I know that I have a bias towards, or excuse me, in favor of vegetarians and vegans, right? Whether I choose to share that or not, I know that I have that bias. So with implicit biases, these are ones that we have, but we don't actually know that we have them, right? They live in our unconscious, they live beneath the surface, but they still influence our thoughts and our actions and our decisions. And they're activated involuntarily and often without our intentional knowledge or control. And so as providers, they can really affect some of the more subtle aspects of care, right? So maybe how we communicate with certain patients about pregnancy or fertility, or maybe how we talk about certain methods with certain patients. So where do these biases come from? The short answer really is everywhere. We've been getting these associations and learning about these dominant cultural stereotypes from so many different sources. And we've been getting this information since we were super young, directly, indirectly, and we've been getting it without our consent, right? So we get messaging about this from television and pop culture, media, education, from our families and social networks. We've been receiving this information forever. And it gets to the point where we can't even really pinpoint sometimes where some of these associations come from, right? You know, if I try to think about what is the first, when is the first time I heard that the stereotype that teenagers are glued to their phones or are defiant, or that old people are bad drivers, right? I can't even tell you where I first heard that association, but I've heard it so many times that at this point, I could easily create a laundry list of these type of stereotypes for you, right? And I'm sure a lot of us could, even if we believe in them or not. One thing I also just wanna point out for anybody that's a Star Wars nerd, thank you for bearing with me for my silly joke. Um, but in the television and pop culture slide, I have a picture from the television show called Pose. If you haven't watched this show, I highly, highly recommend it, right? We're all sheltering in place. we got quarantine going on. We need stuff to watch on TV. <laughs> but what's interesting about this show is that it's about 
trans people of color and particularly the black trans community during the ballroom scene in the 70s and goes on to the 80s and 90s. And what's interesting about the show is it's predominantly written by a black and black trans group and a black, tra or excuse me, and a trans group of color. So it's really interesting how you see this community depicted, right? You don't see the typical stereotypes that we see often about this population in this television show because it's from that community and by that community. So it's an interest, interesting dichotomy between how we actually see this population portrayed. That's a really long, oh, yes? There is a question. Um, <gasps> oh, thank you. Um, if you can mention the quote again. Oh, yes. You totally got the quote right. So the question was, can you mention the quote again from Loretta Jones? Oh, sorry, Loretta Ross. Close. <laughs> Loretta Ross is her name. Um, basically what Loretta Ross says, see if I can do it from memory now, is that we can't look at fertility and pregnancy and maternity without taking in the social context of and the community from which those experiences come from. I'm also very happy to email that out in the reference of the book where she mentioned that as well, if that would be helpful. But thank you for asking. And thank you, Lillian. Appreciate it. Okay. All right, so we're going to launch our first poll of the session, which is very exciting. So Lillian, if you wouldn't mind helping me out. I want to think about implicit bias in relation to contraceptive care. And so just like we have all of these associations and this knowledge of these different stereotypes for a lot of different groups, I'm gonna ask you, for the groups that are listed here, have you ever heard a negative cultural stereotype related to pregnancy or parenting about these groups? So adolescents, unstably housed or houseless people, people with disabilities, people with substance use disorder. And I think we only have the option to select one. So you may have heard something about all of these groups, but I'm just gonna ask you to pick one. Oh, it's so fun to watch this come in. It's like watching racehorses. I don't know if you all can see this too, but okay. And what I also mean by negative cultural stereotypes, have you ever heard someone say something like, oh, I don't think adolescents should be parents or like, mm, I don't know if people with disabilities should really have a baby or things like that. Okay. All right, so Lillian, if you wouldn't mind ending our poll for the sake of time. And I th think you all can see these results, hopefully. It sounds like, you know, we've definitely heard negative cultural stereotypes about each of these groups, right? And most likely, it wasn't really hard for you all to do that poll, right? There are so many groups where we've heard these types of stereotypes about before, right? Like people living with HIV, people who receive public assistance, maybe somebody that already has children, you know, if they've got five or six kids, do they really want to have another child? These are conscious and explicit biases that are relatively easy for us to draw up because we've heard them so many times, right? Whether we believe them or not, we've heard these stereotypes so much and particularly working in our field, right? You know, we've seen colleagues maybe roll their eyes at somebody who wants to be a parent in one of these identity groups or we see data or programming or things like that that address whether these people have the right to be parents or not. So we've seen this so many times. And research demonstrates that even just having an awareness of a cultural stereotype can contribute to bias and it can make us distort the way that we process information about individuals which can ultimately right have a negative impact on how we interact with them so whether we believe these or not unfortunately just being aware of them can have an impact on how we care for people so some of the characteristics of implicit bias right they're pervasive and they're unavoidable every single human being them. And having implicit biases doesn't make you a bad provider, right? It just makes you human. This is just a part of the human condition. We've all grown up in communities and societies. We can't avoid them. It's also important to note that they don't necessarily align with our declared beliefs, right? So for example, in that previous slide, I'm sure many of us don't believe that adolescents couldn't be parents or couldn't be, or couldn't be great parents, right? But 
because I've heard that stereotype so many times, is it possible that maybe it's influenced some of my counseling? Like if I'm talking with a teenager about contraception and I know they say that they want to be a parent and I notice that I'm getting a little nervous about that, could that potentially happen? Absolutely, right? It can definitely creep into our work. And then also we tend to favor our own in-group, kind of like how I favor vegetarians and vegans. I gotta work on that, it's not very gracious of me. Um, but we have this tendency to have biases in favor of people that are like us, right? And against people who are different from us. What's also really fascinating is some of the data shows that we tend to favor in the in-groups of dominant society, right? So for example, someone who may identify as queer may have all these negative implicit biases about queer people, not because they consciously feel that way, but because they've also internalized some of these negative associations, right? So they can show up in lots of strange insidious ways. Nina, and really can, quick, I want oh, to yeah. just read out the, somebody posted a comment um, from Connie. Yes, please. Uh, just says I had a colleague who said um, of our or one of our clients with several children uh, the quote is they need some duct tape I eat to <gasps> keep their together oh geez um could you see I couldn't even hold that gasp in um, right we hear stuff like this all the time and you know I'm assuming you know that colleague probably didn't mean it in a super malicious way or you know to literally mean go get the duct tape but we hear stuff like this in passing so often that we may see it as harmless initially, but after a while, right, those ideas and that mindset can fully start to seep in. Thank you for sharing that. And thanks, Lillian. Okay. So if we look at how does implicit bias affect healthcare overall, right? It can affect our organizational policies, structures, and norms. I like to think of it as, you know, if we as providers, and I'm a health educator, I'm not a clinician, but if I can have implicit biases, right, so can administrators and researchers and people that influence how our organizations are structured. It can also lead to false beliefs. There was a study in 2017 that was looking at cisgender women with disabilities and their contraceptive use. And the majority of them reported that healthcare providers would often incorrectly assume that they weren't sexually active or they weren't interested in childbearing. And that if they did present to a medical appointment pregnant, the providers would often just assume that the pregnancy was undesired, right? And that a lot of that can probably come from the fact that we have this cultural stereotype that people with disabilities aren't physically fit or mentally fit to have children, right? Whether we believe that or not, it can definitely show up in our work. And in turn, those false beliefs can absolutely affect our treatment decisions, right? So in that same study, what was really interesting was they noted that a third of cis women with disabilities were most likely to use sterilization as their primary contraceptive method, directly in comparison with women who didn't have disabilities. So there was no study of implicit bias or like, you know, why is it that that many people had that method for their birth control method? But it does make our bias radar kind of go off, right? When there's a third of a population, an incredibly diverse population at that, using the same method, there's something a little strange about that, right? So I look forward to their follow-up study that's being done on whether that was implicit or explicit bias. But I digress. Um, and then, of course, it can affect our provider and patient interactions, right? Whether it's the frequency of eye contact, maybe how close we're standing next to a patient, our bias can affect our interactions with them physically and the way that we speak or our tone of voice. And that can really affect rapport building and how our clients may feel during the visit, right? So I just want to point out quickly that I'm sure most of us are aware of how explicit bias can contribute to discrimination, right, or health disparities. But we may be less aware of how implicit bias can do the same thing. And it's really important to point out that just because implicit biases are unconscious, it doesn't mean that they don't have important consequences and that they don't still result in perceptions and experiences of discrimination. And I don't point this out to be super shaming or to be like, ha, too bad, we're all contributing to health disparities no matter what we do. But I point it out because research has shown that discrimination resulting from implicit bias, because it's unintentional, 
we tend to hold others and ourselves less accountable for its impacts, right? You know, we give ourselves kind of a mulligan on that. We're like, oh, it was just my implicit bias. I wasn't conscious that I was doing that. But as we know, right, whether my intention is conscious or unconscious, it can definitely have the same impact on the client. So these impacts are no less serious if my bias was implicit or explicit. And it's critical that we're intentionally working to mitigate the consequences of our biases because we really owe that to our clients, right? So finally some good news because I've been a total Debbie Downer so far. So here's the good news, folks. Implicit biases are flexible, right? Our brains are super complex machines and the implicit associations that we have they're formed gradually and they can be unlearned gradually as well, right? Through a number of deep biasing techniques and through doing things like self-reflection and the work that we're doing right now at this very moment. So all is not lost. And the framework which I think can be really helpful to look at these deep biasing techniques from is this one here. And I'm actually just gonna read this out because I think it's a very powerful statement. The key isn't to feel guilty about our implicit biases. Guilt tends toward inaction. It's to become consciously aware of them, minimize them to the greatest extent possible, and constantly check in with ourselves to ensure we are acting based on a rational assessment of the situation rather than on stereotypes and prejudice. And it's that part that really gets me every time, right? That guilt tends toward inaction. That it's okay to feel icky about these biases once we're conscious of them. It's okay to have that reaction, but we don't want that to let us to stop us, right, and to prevent us from moving forward. So it's really that ongoing self-reflection. This is so, so critical, team, to uncovering our biases and working against them. Because like we said, right, these implicit, implicit and unconscious biases, they're super tricky because often we don't even know we have them, right? So how do you treat something and you don't even know it exists? Super complicated. So one tool that we're gonna give you is this website and oh actually Lillian if you wouldn't mind I know I didn't ask you to do this before so I apologize if you wouldn't mind just chatting this link in for people I really appreciate it I can also email it to folks after as well um but Harvard oh thank you Lillian so Harvard put together a series of implicit bias tests they're about 20 minutes long and they're on a ton of different topics um I really encourage you to take some of them they can be really eye-opening and kind of interesting you, know, you can also find that you might have implicit biases against groups that you belong to, which is always a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, but like I said before, you know, they can maybe be surprising or bring up some icky feelings. So I'm going to encourage you to sit with your feelings, but to also not let it result in inaction, right? It's a good thing to figure these biases out. That work is good because it helps us move forward. Okay, before I move on, are there any other questions about implicit bias so far? Check the chat. Okay, I don't see any. Thank you for doing that, Lion. Okay. So now we're gonna move on to cultural humility. And so many of you may be familiar with cultural humility, but also with cultural competency. And the two are related, but I'm gonna highlight some of the differences between the two. So again, what is cultural humility? This is a concept that was originally developed by Melanie Turvalon and Jan Mary Garcia, two physicians, and they put this idea together in 1998, initially to address health disparities and institutional inequities in medicine. But now we know that cultural humility has been adopted and used by so many different fields, right? From social work, education, to obviously public health. And by definition, it's the ability to maintain an interpersonal stance that's other oriented or open to the other in relation to aspects of cultural identity that are most important to the person. So I know that's a little bit of a mouthful. So let's break that down a little bit. So as I said earlier, right, cultural humility is related to cultural competency and that it builds off of this concept and cultural competency means or it refers to the ability that we have to understand and work with people of different cultures and within our own culture successfully, right? And it really tends to focus on knowledge or fact-based information. So knowing different facts about a particular culture you might be working with, for example. And I wanna note that I think that's actually a really good starting place, right? It's not a bad thing to know this information about the different cultures that we work with, right? Like for example, I think it's obviously it's super important to know 
what are the most commonly spoken languages in your patient population, right? Do you have a lot of English language learner students in your school or in your facility? Is that something you might want to think about when it comes to making your services or your materials or educational resources accessible? So I think having some of that fact-based information is really helpful and important. And while cultural humility acknowledges that, it also really emphasizes that we can't ever be competent in a particular culture, right? We're never gonna know everything about a cultural identity because culture isn't static, right? It's always changing, it's shifting. And I like to say that there are as many cultures as there are people, right? One person's understanding of their faith is not the same as somebody else, even if they're from the same faith tradition, from the same religious community, right? So instead of assuming competency or assuming some type of endpoint, we wanna be really humble in how we practice inclusion. And this is something that I just, I cannot emphasize enough and I feel very strongly about as you can tell, is that cultural humility is a process, right? It's not a status. There is no training, there's no book, there's no certificate we can do that will make us totally culturally humble and know all the things about all the different identity groups, right? Instead, I think it's more helpful to kind of think of it as this continuous process as we see here, right? Where we're gaining knowledge and skills, we're doing that self-reflection work, and we're seeking cross-cultural experiences so that we can learn more about people who may be different from us or who may also be from our own community. Think of it more as the process or the circle as opposed to a status or endpoint. And I feel like, you know, everything's got tenants. From Diane. Oh, great. Uh, Diane is asking if you have any resources on stigma, especially around HIV and AIDS. Mm. Oh, Diane, thank you so much for that question. You know, there are a couple of organizations that I actually know that are based in Oakland, California that are coming to mind, but I can't pinpoint their resources right now. One thing that we might want to do, let me do a little extra research for you, and then I'm happy to reach back out if you just want to drop your email address you know, maybe in the Q&A or elsewhere. I'll also have my email available later on and then you can just shoot me a quick email. Um, Cause I can't think of any instantly, but it's a topic I feel strongly about. So I'm very grateful that you asked. Thank you. I love these questions. Feel free to have them keep coming in guys. And thank you Lillian uh, for reading those out when I miss them. All right, so the three tenets of cultural humility, right? Lifelong learning and self-reflection. This is something that we as individuals have power over and that we can do in our daily practice. We're doing it right now, FYI. We wanna recognize and change power imbalances, which is, I feel like, really my current battle cry of life. Um, <laughs> but that's something that we can do with our clients. It may be something that we can do with our colleagues, but we also wanna acknowledge that workplaces also have hierarchies, right? So. It's not always as easy when your livelihood may be on the line. So we just put out potentially there to acknowledge that. And then there's institutional accountability. This is really looking at the policies of our institution and our organizations and seeing how bias may be affecting that and where we can be culturally humble in that as well. So today's training is mostly about self-reflection. We are going to touch on all of these different tenants briefly, but I just want to acknowledge that we're really mostly focusing on the first one today. So let's dive into that a little bit more. So an example of where we may wanna do some self-reflection around our understanding of menstrual or uterine bleeding can be helpful if we wanna remain culturally humble when we're talking, to or we're talking to clients about this topic, right? So we know that each contraceptive method or each of our hormonal, I should say, contraceptive methods may or may not have effects on our uterine bleeding. Oh, that's a lie not necessarily just our hormonal ones, our non-hormonal ones can have effects too. <laughs> anyway, we know that these different methods can have effects on bleeding patterns, right? And that bleeding pattern changes are really important to clients. Understandably, right? That's a really big deal to somebody, how a method might affect their period. So we know that for some of our combined methods, the mini pill, the shot can have different effects listed here. We also know that each of the LARC methods, see, there's that copper IUD that tripped me up. It can also have a distinct pattern change on our periods. So when we think of cultural humility and bleeding pattern changes or bleeding in general, it can be really helpful to acknowledge that 
periods and monthly uterine bleeding can mean such different things to our different clients, right? They can have a lot of different weight in them. Feel free to chat some in if you have some ideas on what a monthly period or uterine bleeding might mean for someone. But I'm just gonna go over a few here too. So it could be a cleansing ritual for someone, right? It could also be an indicator of fertility. It could be letting you know that you're not pregnant or that maybe you could still become pregnant. Period might also be a time when someone can abstain from sex, and that may be something they want or that they don't want, right? But if a client say, let's say that they view their period as a cleansing ritual, right? They just feels like it cleanses their body. It's something that's really important to them. Let's them know that their body is working just right. And I'm counseling them on the Mirena IUD, right? And I say, well, if you go with the Mirena, there's a good chance that you won't have a period. Isn't that great? If someone views it as a cleansing ritual, it might feel really uncomfortable to them, right? For me to just kind of assume that they don't want their period. Just to be like, wouldn't that be fabulous? Like, let's get rid of that period. But it's actually something really important to them, right? And I've just made a huge assumption about what their period might mean to them. So this is an opportunity for us to be neutral and culturally humble and acknowledging that this means something so different for so many people. We also have this tendency in our community to describe intermenstrual bleeding and spotting as nuisance or like bothersome bleeding, right? And what's actually really implicit in this terminology is that the bleeding is like annoying, right? It's just a little bother, but it's not truly life-changing or disruptive. And you know, that may be the case for some clients, but that also may not be the case for some others, right? We're having that that intermenstrual bleeding or having that spotting could really be unacceptable for them. And so it's really important for us to talk with our individual clients about what their period means to them or what that bleeding might mean to them and use that information to also help them select a method. Because we know, right, bleeding can impact so many things, right? It can impact your work, your social activities, pretty much every part of your daily life. It could also impact sex, your budget, right? These methods are not cheap. I won't go on my rant about how like menstrual cups and pads and tampons should be free, but I'll save that for another day, but they are incredibly expensive, right? It could also have an effect on your safety. If we have a client, right? If we have a student whose parent is tracking their menstrual product use or tracking their menstrual cycle, they have a method that automatically stops their cycle and they don't want their parent to know they're using birth control, that's going to put their safety in danger too, right? For our trans and gender diverse clientele, it could trigger some feelings of gender dysphoria, which is also related to safety, right? If you're somebody that identifies as a trans masculine person, for example, you may not feel safe bringing a box of tampons into a changing room, or it might out you in a way that doesn't feel okay or safe to you. So we want to be conscious of these different things. And it can also affect our participation in cultural or religious ceremonies. So I always like to give the example of, I'm from Kathmandu, Nepal, and for us, we're mostly a Hindu country, but we're also a Buddhist country. And in both of these traditions, um, you're not supposed to go to temple on your period. It's, you know, the body is seen as unclean. It's part of the culture to not do that. And so last time I was home, I was talking to a friend who had to sit out of a big holiday because she was on her period. I was like, why don't you just get a marina, right? You can... We can go to the temple all we want. We can pray all we want. We don't have to worry about missing any of the big holidays and then having that awkward conversation when someone asks why you're missing it. Um, but for her, her period was really a cleansing ritual. So that felt really wrong to her, right? She was like, no, I like having my period. That's really important to me. Which this was also my high school rebellion when you know I would go to temple on my period and feel like I was being really badass feminist only to be disappointed to find out that nobody in my family actually cared, but <laughs> that's neither here nor there. Maybe At any rate, right? From Diane, uh, she also oh, yes. puts that it could be to prove to others that they are not pregnant. And for sex workers, it can be days of rest. Absolutely, right, Diane, that's such a great point, right? It can absolutely affect your profession, right? For sex workers, that could be a day of rest for them. Also, like you said, to maybe prove to others that they're not pregnant. Right? So maybe they have somebody that wants to ensure that they aren't pregnant and that's the time of proof, right? I know actually it's giving a lecture um, on contraceptive methods to some high schoolers a couple of months ago and they were talking about how 
they were super nervous to have methods that didn't give them their period because it's like, you know, that was just like for sure. They knew that they were not pregnant once they got that. And that reassurance, like taking a pregnancy test a couple times a month or whatever it was, like that wasn't going to be enough for them. The period was like the solid proof. They didn't want that to be taken away. I love that. Oh, I'm also glad to see people have resources here and are asking for more. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I apologize. It's a little challenging to go back and forth, so I'm not keeping eye on chat as much as I would like, but Lillian's coming <laughs> and back to that. At time check, we are at 1.11, so you have about 19 minutes left. Ha, perfect. Okay. Thank you, Lillian. So as we've been saying, and as I'm saying like a broken record, right, self-reflection, super important to cultural humility, super, super central. And so in the spirit of honest self-reflection, I'm going to ask us to do another poll. And when you participate in this activity, I'm going to be asking you about frustrating client situations. So, you know, these are common situations that we see in contraceptive counseling and care that we might deem as frustrating. And I really just want to note that it's perfectly normal to be frustrated with patients, right? Or to be frustrated in general. Like we are providers, but we're also human. And we also have the right to get frustrated with situations. As long as we are keeping this to ourselves, right? We're not layering that on the client. That's totally okay. And I really want to normalize that because I think sometimes we hold ourselves to the standard, this like superhero standard, and we're human too, right? So Lillian, if you wouldn't mind launching our next poll. I'm gonna ask, have you ever felt frustrated when a patient did one of these things? And again, I don't think we can select all, unfortunately, so I'm just gonna ask you to maybe select one that, you know, really burns your toast. Let's see. There it is, okay. Oh, wait a minute. I think I'm doing the wrong poll. My bad. Sorry, Lillian. <laughs> um, oh, I, I see. Yeah, I think you have to scroll down a little bit to see the poll. Gotcha. My apologies, everyone. Thank you, Lillian. Wow, I'm really bad at Hubala. Hubala? It's a learning curve for everybody. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that patients use emergency contraception as their birth control method and the patient tells you they don't want to get pregnant but won't use birth control because they think they'll be fine. Those are the highest scoring. Okay. Awesome. Thank you everyone for participating. Oh, thanks for the heads up, Connie, too. <laughs> okay. I also included that final one about patients thinking that they'll be fine because that's something that I constantly hear from people that work in SBHCs or with students. I'm like, they always tell me that they'll be fine. They're like, no worries. So thank you for participating that everyone. Apologies for my confusion of polls. Move forward. So I'm gonna be mindful of our time. I'm gonna speed a little bit through this. So my apologies. Um, but I want us to think about what makes those scenarios challenging, right? Like, why is it challenging when a patient says they don't want to get pregnant, they don't want to use a contraceptive method, and they are having the type of sex that will result in pregnancy, or that can, excuse me, result in pregnancy, right? That's frustrating sometimes because we want what's best for our clients, right? And when their actions don't align with the goals that they've set for themselves, we can feel really helpless in that moment, right? Where it's like, oh, I want to help you, but the, you know, the numbers aren't in your favor, or I can't guarantee that that won't happen to you if you take these actions. And it can be really hard for us sometimes, right, to really struggle in that situation. But what's inherent in that frustration is the assumption that our client's doing something wrong. Right? And that maybe we have the right answer or we know what the right decision is, but what they're doing is wrong. And so if we have that mindset, if that's inherent, you know, deep down in our frustration, if that's what's part of the root of it, how might that affect our counseling or the care that we're providing to our clients? So one of our objectives today is to really reflect on our values and our biases 
and our moments of frustration or our moments of elation or where we're feeling super happy about what a client has done, those can offer a great window into our own values and our own implicit biases, right? And the more that we're aware of them, the better we're able to overcome them and to provide neutral, unbiased counseling and care. So these are a list of questions that can be really helpful just to reflect on or as you continue to do your self-reflection practices in your work after you meet with a patient. Right? If you have those feelings of frustration or you have those feelings of happiness that they did leave with the method or frustration that they didn't leave with the method or that they're choosing emergency contraception as their primary method, these questions can kind of just be helpful to ground you and maybe think a little bit about what's going on beneath the surface, right? So maybe what assumptions did I make? What am I curious about? What information do I kind of wish I knew or had more on? Did I feel frustrated or pleased? And did I have a specific outcome in mind for this session or for this person? I'm gonna put a pin in this because we're gonna come back to it in a little bit. Okay, so the second tip, right, is recognizing and changing power imbalances. And this is something that's really important for us to do in healthcare, considering that the patient's got, you know, the odds stacked against them, right? There's already a power dynamic in which we are seen as the sources of all the information and our patient is there to learn from us, right? But if we have provider-driven counseling, right? This type of counseling where we're trying to persuade somebody to maybe not use EC as their birth control, or maybe we're trying to persuade them to use the birth control method because if they have sex without, that could result in pregnancy without a contraceptive method, they may get pregnant, right? And we know they don't want that. So we may try to convince them otherwise. If we fall into that kind of mold of provider-driven counseling, we're much more likely to amplify the power differential that already exists between provider and patient, right? Where our expertise, our knowledge is seen as more important or more valued than the patient's knowledge and their expertise. And this isn't really patient-centered or culturally humble, is it? Right? Like there's a clear power imbalance here. And not only is this not what we want for our patients, right? It's like not what I would want out of my own contraceptive counseling visit. But the data shows us that it's associated with lower satisfaction and method discontinuation. So it's really a lose-lose here, right? Our patient's not going to feel great about their visit, and they're probably just not going to fill that script that we sent out for them anyway. So I want us to think about how we can change that power imbalance that already exists between us and the patient, right? How can we really elevate their knowledge and what they know and their expertise in their own lives? Because we might have the clinical knowledge, right? They've got all the other information, right? They know what they like, what they don't like, how their body feels, how their body reacts to a method. They have all that extra super important information into making a choice. And if we can really liberate ourselves from having a specific goal or outcome in mind for a session, we're really gonna promote more patient autonomy in that situation. We like to think of it as investing in the process rather than the outcome. And I know that seems a little strange because we're so invested in our work, right? And we really want what's best for our clients. So really what determines a successful contraceptive counseling visit, right, is when our client feels heard and supported. And so we, this really requires us to trust our patients, to trust all of our patients, and to know that they're capable of handling the outcomes of their actions and that they know what's best for them. Right? And I really also say the word liberate because something I hear from providers all the time is like, oh, I failed my patient. They didn't do X, Y, or Z. I failed them. And you didn't fail them if they felt supported and heard, right? We have to take some of that pressure off of us, right? We don't need to be the one making that decision for them. We shouldn't and we don't have to. So let's do a quick case study. Um, Great, thank you for the time, Mark. I appreciate it. Let's do a quick case study and we'll be mindful of our time. But we have a patient here named May, right? So my friend May uses they, them, theirs pronouns. They're 18 and they have one child. They got a copper IUD about two months ago and we're really not feeling the heavy bleeding that's coming with that. May comes into your clinic and says, I wanna get this IUD out right now. So I'm gonna skip this. Now this is the final poll. <laughs> Gonna ask you all to, if May comes into your office and says, I want this IUD out right now, what is the very first thing we want to tell May? And I really want to emphasize, this is the first thing we say in response to their statement, 
I want this IUD out right now. Okay, the poll is up and I'm just waiting for folks to select. I know it's a lot to read, so <laughs> take your time though. All right, do we want to remind me that, you know, heavy bleeding, super common, not usually a cause for concern. Do you want to offer options to help manage the heavy bleeding? Maybe tell them to stick it out a little longer, see if the bleeding improves. Do we want to say, ugh, unfortunately, yes, heavier bleeding is common with the copper IUD. Can you tell me a little bit more about how the bleeding has been a problem for you? You can see if I can help. Or do we want to say, it sounds like this has been really frustrating for you. We can absolutely remove your IUD today. Hey. Do you want me to end the poll? Yeah, let's do it. Sorry to rush folks, but <laughs> I'll keep track of time. All right. Hey. So it looks like, I don't know if you can see it on your screen, Nina, but it looks like the one with the highest percentage is tied for the last two answers. <laughs> Ooh, for C and D. Oh, we got a tie. Great. Thank you, Lillian. Um, so I want to emphasize that all of these are things that we may want to bring up in a visit, right? We may want to talk to somebody about how it's not a common, it's a common thing that happens, right? We don't want, we want to normalize this for our patients. We may want to give them some different options, but with the last two options, right? With C and D, we see a lot of validation, which is also super helpful. But what I'm going to give an extra vote to option D, because when May comes in saying we want, they want this IUD out, that's super strong language, right? They're saying, no, I want this out right now. And we know that clients with IUDs and implants often face barriers to obstacles to having those methods removed. So we don't know if May has maybe gone to another provider and they refused to take it out, or if you know they were in a situation where they were given this method but they didn't really want it. We don't really know the backstory there, right? But we wanna affirm right away that we are on their side and that, yes, we can absolutely remove it for you today. But let's also talk about what's going on. By addressing that conflict there, we're absolutely addressing a power imbalance. So we don't want patients to feel like this, right? They shouldn't have to fight us to have their method removed, right? But many patients report feeling this way. Something a colleague of mine, Dr. Okendo Del Toro, says is that our patients aren't hostages or prisoners to their method, right? I love that. And like, this isn't a cable package from Comcast that's impossible to quit, right? Or a gym membership where it's like, you're stuck in the contract for six months for some reason, you just can't quit even though you don't like the gym, right? We don't want our patients to feel this way. That's not our goal for them. And something that Alyssa Perucci from UCSF's Women's Option Center always says is that your patient has the answer. And I always think of that as a super helpful reminder, right? That they are the experts in their lives and that ultimately their method choice is not our decision and it shouldn't be our decision. We gotta trust that they know what they're doing if we wanna address those power imbalances. So just to reiterate, right? For IUD and implant removal, patients can have it whenever they want, there's no preferred duration. And one way that we might want to address this power imbalance is rem remembering to include information about removal during informed consent or during your visit. You know, just reminding somebody, if you want to have this method removed for whatever reason, you can come back to us and we'll take care of that for you. So really quick, our final tenet is institutional accountability. So something we may have thought of with May's case, right? And I know that I have definitely personally thought this before, patient comes back three months after having an implant removed, or excuse me, an IUD removed, and they're thinking, oh my God, they're so expensive, right? Like, this is such a waste of limited resources. I couldn't give somebody access to a method the same day because we were out of stock because we gave you this one, and now you don't want it. It's super easy to get stuck in that mindset, right? But I want to also think about what we said about implicit biases, right? Affecting our policies and our protocols. They can also affect our institutional culture. Like, do we have a culture in our clinic where we tell clients to just stick it out a little longer if they want a method removed three months after it was placed, right? Is our funding based on the number of LARC insertions or is it based on the number of young people that 
uptake or excuse me, that take on a contraceptive method, right? Is that something we can talk about with our funder? Is that something that we want to look at? So I just want to revisit this diagram really quickly and to reiterate that this training is really focusing on the first and the second tenant, right? I mean, if there, I wish we could have a webinar for you where we could teach you how to overthrow all institutional biases and negative <laughs> institutional policies, um, because I would totally take that webinar, but it's not necessarily possible. And I really want to note that today's session is about sustainable and practical ways, right, to address our biases. So these are things that we know that we can start with on our own today and with our clients today. So I really hope that going over all of this didn't feel overwhelming. We're not asking you to take on cultural humility at every level of your work and your profession. So just want to say I hope it wasn't overwhelming because I was really going for invigorating, but we wanted to touch on all of the different tenets for you. So as we close, these are some of the best practices for providers that have been identified by contraceptive counseling experts, right? Getting to know your patient, remembering that there's so much more to the story than birth control. And we want to honor people's expertise and knowledge of their own lives. Listen more than you speak. Super hard to take seriously from me since I've been jabbering for an hour. We want to leave the door open, right? Invest in the process, not the outcome. Make sure that that door is open so if they do come back with questions, they know that they feel safe with you. And we want to do our own self-reflection on our identity and our practices. So this was a lot of information for one hour, and I know it could be a bit overwhelming too. So the thought I want to leave us with today are us to kind of brainstorm, what are some concrete commitments that you will make to practice cultural humility and address bias? We don't really have time to do this collectively as a group, I'm afraid, but I'm just going to encourage you to think of something you might want to start doing, maybe something you want to stop doing, and something that you're doing that's great. You want to keep doing that in terms of working towards concrete commitments to addressing bias. So like, for example, something that I want to keep doing is my own self-reflection about my biases when they come up. And something that I want to start doing is thinking a little bit more about what are my method biases. I know that I have a bit of a bias against the patch that I've been working on. So that's something I want to start really focusing on in particular. So I invite you individually to kind of think of this. Just to summarize, right, we want to focus on the process of counseling instead of the outcome. Bias really impacts people's lives and care. It's really our responsibility to address this as healthcare providers. And we want to practice cultural humility and self-reflection so that we can neutralize these biases. Okay, I'm going to ask if anyone has any questions or reflections or resources to share and feel free to do so in the chat. But I'm also going to give you my email and ask that when you have a moment today, I know you've got a busy day with the conference, to please fill out the survey from Beyond the Pill about our session. We take your feedback really seriously and really value it in order to make our presentations better. So, Lillian, if you wouldn't mind actually chatting this into um, the chat box, I would really appreciate it. Both my email actually and the uh, survey link, if you don't mind. Yes, and I will. And thank you so much. Awesome, thank you, Lillian. And thank you so much for Half hanging minute. with me, guys. Have some questions um, in the chat if you want to answer them. But somebody is asking if you have any strategies to provide counseling to individuals who come in, but may not necessarily be regular patients. Mm, so somebody that, you know, you might not see again, right? But somebody that just comes in. You may not have that relationship, right? Especially with students that like, you're going to build that rapport. So somebody's going to come back to you all the time. I think even with those patients, it's so important to leave the door open because they might remember you like five years later, or they may remember a conversation you've had with them much later in time or whenever they're ready to take on the care that they need, for example. But if you have left the door open and you've kind of placed that, that sense of security with them, they'll know that they can come back to you if they need to. But at the same time, you may have a large effect on their healthcare journey more than you might think, right? Um, I think Maya Angelou, I'm going to butcher the quote, unfortunately, but Maya Angelou said something along the lines of, you know, people might not remember what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. So I think about that a lot with those clients too, right? I might not see them all the time, but I want to make sure they know that they can come back to me if they need to. 
Perfect. Um, I believe that was the last question. There are just some other comments on um, in the chat. But I also added Nina's email on there and the survey is in the chat as well, if you all can uh, fill that out for us. And Nina, I want to thank you so much for for this wonderful workshop. I, as you can see in the comments, I think people were very grateful and I think you provided a lot of helpful resources. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. I really appreciate it. And please feel free to reach out to me. I love hearing from folks since I know we only had a short amount of time today. So thank you so much for all that you do. Thank you, everybody. See you later. <laughs>